Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me welcome you to the service today. It's good to see you. We're glad that uh, we're able to fellowship uh, together this morning. I want to uh, ask you uh, even now to take your Bibles, whether you have them in print form or whether you have it in tablet electronic form, uh, however you have the scriptures today, and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. And the title of what we're going to do today is called Prepared for His Coming. And uh, I got thinking about this um, subject that I wanted to talk about, that is the coming of the Lord. And I thought about a passage of one that maybe we're familiar with. And as I got thinking about it and looking into my stuff a little bit, I don't know that I've ever preached a sermon about the second coming from the text of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. And so I thought, how in the world did I miss that? So it was enjoyable for me uh, to get into the Word a little bit, and the research and such. And so uh, here's where we're going to go today. Uh, prepared for the Lord's coming, Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse number 1. <clears throat> Jesus speaking says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Now while the, um, uh, but the prudent rather, uh, took oil in their flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No. There will not be enough for us and for you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for, your, for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. Well, we have, I think, a pretty, uh, pretty easy, pretty familiar situation wise people and foolish people and here we have a situation at a wedding now jesus knew a little bit about what happened at weddings you might remember that jesus his disciples and his mother were all invited to a wedding feast in cana of galilee and you know that this is where he performed his very first miracle by turning the water into wine this parable that we just read is very true to life as it reflects what might typically happen at a wedding in the first century in Palestine. We have here the ceremony itself may have well been held at the home of the bride. And after that particular ceremony at the bride's house was over, a large procession, like a parade, through the streets of the city or the village would be held, and uh, there would be great celebration going on. This was a happy, exciting day. And eventually, the bridal party would arrive at the home of the bridegroom. And there they would be uh, welcomed by these virgins holding their lamp, lighting their way into where there would be a great feast and a great banquet. These young women had the job to have their lights ready because if it took place at night, they would shine the way into the banquet hall. So here we learn some interesting things. No one really knew how long all this was going to take or any possible delays that they might encounter on their way from the home of the bride through the town and the celebration and eventually getting to the home of the bridegroom. So they had to be prepared for whenever he came with their very small oil lamp and maybe a flask that had just a little bit more oil in case the bridegroom was longer than anticipated. 
And sure enough, this is how the story goes. It was a long while before the groom and the wedding party finally showed up. And in this parable, we have five of the young ladies who were wise enough to have kept a little oil for use if there was a delay, and others who just had their lamp and never gave it another thought. And now we have a problem. The foolish virgins had no more oil for their lamp, and so they said to the wise, hey, hey, hey give us some of your oil. And they said, no. Now, doesn't that at first seem awful selfish? But we find here a very important lesson that the wise said to them, look, there's not going to be enough for us and you both. In other words, you're kind of on your own here. You should have prepared. You should have been ready. You need to go back into town, see if you can find somebody to have some oil. I don't think there was a Walmart there, but whatever they could have done to find a little oil to light their lamps to get back. But unfortunately, while the foolish virgins were gone, trying to find somebody who could sell them some oil, the bridegroom and the party did make their way there. They got into the banquet hall, and the door was shut. And now when the foolish get back to, hey, hey, let us in, we're here, that sad reply comes, truly, I do not know you. I don't know who you are. And they were left out. And so the summation of the parable is, be on alert for that day, for you don't know the day or the hour. From about the moment Jesus ascended into heaven, people have been wondering about when are you going to return? When are you going to come back? And you might remember as the disciples <laughs> stared up into the sky, men, uh, uh, angels from heaven appeared next to them and said, look, the way Jesus went up into heaven is the way he's going to come back. And so they were told to go back into the city and wait for the promises and so forth. But it has been our desire pretty much ever since the Lord left to ask the question, when? How much longer? When is he going to be here? When is Jesus going to rescue us from the sin and mess of this world and take us to that place where there is no more weeping, no more gnashing of teeth. This has led many, many through the centuries to try to figure out when the Lord is going to come back. I want to take you to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. It was August of 1998. I was standing in the checkout line of the grocery store named Food Lion. And back in that day, you might remember as you stood to put your groceries on the belt, there were the tabloid <laughs> newspapers. Remember, the National Enquirer was the big one. But there was another one maybe you've heard of called the Weekly World News. Now, the Weekly World News is great journalism. It was them who broke that story of actually having top secret pictures of a Martian <laughs> in the Oval Office shaking hands with Bill Clinton. Now, now you got to know, I mean, this is true stuff, right? And so on this particular edition of the Weekly World News, there was a headline that read, Reveal the exact date of the second coming of Jesus Christ. I was interested. Mm -hmm. I was curious. What did they know that I didn't know? And so we spent on that day an extra $1.25 so I could buy that edition of the Weekly World News. I took it home and I began going through the pages and sure enough in bold letters, revealed the exact date of Jesus' second coming. Now you'll want to listen to this because it said it was November 12th and we're just a, you know weeks away from November 12th. But sadly enough, November 12th, 1999. Oh, that day has come. That day is gone. It's been decades since November 12th, 1999. I guess the weekly world news didn't know it after all. We could go back to 1818. There in upstate New York, a farmer and a lay preacher by the name of William Miller who with his uh, King James Bible and a concordance began looking and running through some numbers. And the way he calculated it was this, that the Lord would return somewhere between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. Oh, he was excited. 
He thought he had finally figured out everything that we needed to know to figure out all those numbers and dates from the Old Testament and figure it out when the Lord was going to return. He began to preach about the coming of the Lord. He had some friends and they got together and they narrowed the date to October 27th, 1844. He would go to preach and say the Lord is coming on October the 27th of 1844. Do you know that people actually quit their jobs, sold their possessions, even going so far as selling their homes? I mean, I'm not going to go to work if I know the Lord's coming tomorrow. You know, I'll be there in the backyard looking up in the sky. No, so these people, they left their livelihoods, and you know where this story is going. October 27th, 1844 came, and it went. All these people who listened to and believed this man rather than the word of God went home literally empty-handed. Hmm. fellow by the name of Charles T. Russell. Now, you may not know that name, but I guarantee that you've seen the work of his wicked hands every time you have driven by a kingdom hall of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Charles T. Russell, back in the early 1900s, he too thought he had figured out that the return of the Lord was going to be in 1914. Well, you know what happened about 1912, give or take a little bit, a little matter of World War I. And when, he, when World War I came and there was a mass global conflict, he became more sure of it that the Lord indeed was going to come back any time around 1914. But again, as you figured out, the Lord did not come back in 1914. Those who followed Charles T. Russell and the Jehovah's Witnesses started to choose other dates, and each and every time, they were wrong. And so, believe it or not, even though they remain convinced that the Lord's return is imminent, Jehovah's Witnesses do not pick dates anymore because if your leaders were wrong about that, what else might they be wrong about? And so they decided they didn't want to lose any more members because of it. And then we come to a fellow by the name, and you might even have this book in your library at home, in the early 70s, give or take a little bit, a fellow by the name of Hal Lindsey. Do you know that name? Hal Lindsey, who wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. I tell you what, that book set the evangelical world on fire with that brand of thinking about the coming of the Lord, and many people thought that we would not see 1975. Now, if you're making notes here, make a note in 1975 because they say no other year in history has been chosen for the second coming of the Lord more than 1975. Uh-oh. We're a few years away from 1975 now, aren't we? They were all wrong. But still, the prognosticators continue. Several years ago, there was a phenomenon uh, out in the uh, space, uh, something that they began to call the blood moon. Do you remember the talk about the blood moons? And a fellow by the name of John Hagee, which unfortunately you can still watch him on TV, started to say that the Lord was now going to return, and he had his Old Testament prophecies lined up that the Lord would return probably between 2014 and 2015 at the conclusion of the blood moons. Well, welcome to 2022, and still the Lord hasn't returned. One thing I can guarantee you this morning, that anybody who says they know when the Lord is going to return is always 100% wrong. 100% wrong. No one's got it right. Why is that? Take a look at Matthew chapter 24, and where Jesus said, along about verse 34 to 36, no one knows the hour or the day. And so when William Miller thought he figured out he didn't know the hour of the day. When Charles T. Russell, when Hal Lindsey, when John Hagee, and if I ever get so stupid as to tell you I know when it is, don't believe me either. No one knows the hour or the day. They are always 100% wrong. 
But every time there's something that goes on in the world, you know, whatever happens in Israel, the Middle East, I didn't even give you all my illustrations about the Gulf War one and two. They all thought, uh, uh, people thought that the Lord was coming back then when that took place, but he didn't. But even as far back as the first century, right after Jesus ascended into heaven, People were curious, and we don't blame them. I want to see the return of the Lord. And so they started wondering, when is it going to be? The Apostle Paul had something to say about this. You can read about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul said that the second coming of Jesus will not happen. Now you got to really follow me here. He said, until two things take place. Number one, the apostasy. That is a falling away. False doctrine, false teaching coming into the church, which it has. Mm -hmm. And number two, the appearance of the man of lawlessness, often referred to as the Antichrist. So people have been wondering, when is the Antichrist going to get here? When is it going to happen? I want to tell you this morning, and I believe this to be true, both of those events have already taken place. There has been false teaching that's come into the church, and the Antichrist has already come. And like, how do you know? How, how can you say that? Read with me, if, uh, uh, if you will, what 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18 says. Now, you've got to read this careful, and I want to remind you that this is John, an apostle of the Lord speaking, not Blair, even though I'm going to read it to you. This is what John has said. And so if we have an argument with what's about to be said, take it up with John or the Holy Spirit that inspired him. Don't take it up with me. John says in 1 John 2.18, Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. John says you heard Antichrist is coming. I tell you many Antichrists have come here. From this we know that it is the last hour. 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 also mentions the rise of false prophets teaching what is false. There's your apostasy. John says this is the spirit of the Antichrist that is now already in the world. Now already in the world. And then 2 John verse 7, that little Bible book there, they're almost to the end of the book. 2 John verse 7 says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Still wonder. There has been false teaching in the world, and there have been many antichrists that have been in the world from the very first century. Thus, I think we can say Jesus can come back at any time. There is nothing that is holding back the Lord from returning, even to this very day, except the patience of God. Mm -hmm. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So when we read the word of the Lord that says, I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, we wonder when. I think it's okay to wonder when. I think it's okay to say, will it be in my lifetime? Will I get to see the heavens unfold with my eyes? Or will the Lord continue to delay his coming? I believe that the Lord indeed is coming back. Scripture often uses the term like a thief in the night. You're familiar with that. Jesus described it as being as they were in the days of Noah. He says they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until a flood came and took them all away. Paul not only uses the imagery of the thief in the night, if you read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 and some other places, but he also describes the events surrounding the return of Jesus in a very significant way. And I do want to call your attention to this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, Paul says this, 
For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night while they are saying, here it is, peace and safety. Then destruction comes upon them like birth pangs upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. And so sometimes we see all the news, all oh, the economy's bad. What's going to happen with, uh, you know, the Ukraine? Will Russia launch the nukes? What will China do? And we get so wrapped up in the rumors of wars and the problems and, you know, our politics. I like this guy. I like another guy. And yet Paul says it's going to be a day like any other day. While people are saying peace and safety, hey, I got nothing to worry about. Everything's good in my life. I can just kind of skate on through. Then Paul says that destruction comes upon them like a thief in the night. We need to be ready. Many of us are kind of like those foolish young ladies. We know he's going to come, but we're just not making any preparations for it whatsoever. There are lessons that we need to learn about the second coming of Jesus from this parable. And this will help us identify us as whether we're on the wise side or whether we're on the foolish side. We need to get some things right here today. Three lessons I want to share with you about this text this morning. Number one, uh, I think well, we pretty well have this one figured out. The Lord is going to return. If there was a first coming, there is going to be a second coming. Jesus promised it. I will come again. The angel said the way Jesus goes up is the way he's going to come back down again. And in the parable we just read, there was never any real question about the bridegroom getting there eventually. They just didn't know when. Some had planned that it might be a little while. There might be a delay. The foolish ones, not so much. They were just hanging out. And then they realized at the last minute, <clears throat> it was going to be too late. How do we know <clears throat> Jesus is going to come back again? There is a guarantee, by the way, that he will. And that guarantee is his resurrection from the dead. We just had some time around the Lord's table, figuratively speaking, this morning. And you remember how Paul describes it? He said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, help me out, until he comes. Until he comes. Every time, Christian, you partake of that cup and of that bread, you are saying, I believe that A, Jesus died, and B, he was resurrected, and C, he is going to come again one day. That is your testimony of faith. That is your proclamation. That is the sermon that you preach by being here every Sunday. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We don't think the Lord's dead anymore, and we think that one day he is going to come back and receive us to himself. The angels likewise affirmed the truthfulness of the second coming to the apostles. It's going to happen. We don't have the time here this morning to go through the book of Revelation and all the great and glorious references to the Lord coming back one day. But I pray this morning that there is no doubt in your mind and in your heart that one day Jesus is going to come back and if you believe that with all your mind and heart, then you are also making preparations for that day. We don't know when. I don't know when, but I believe it could be at any time. So number one, the Lord is going to return. Number two, each of us must be prepared. And along with that, we can't rely on anyone else to get us in. We need to be prepared for ourselves. And we can't rely that someone else is going to have enough of what it takes to get us into heaven. You see, the image of that thief in the night, it reminds us to be ready. Because the nasty, mean things about thieves is they don't call ahead and let you know that they're going to come. I don't know if many of you have ring doorbells now. Uh, every now and again, our phone just starts binging and buzzing and dinging and telling us someone's in our backyard. Someone's out on the one side of the house, someone's at the front door. You know, those are helpful things to have. Uh, real quick story, the first night we got a ring doorbell. You know, we're all excited, we're watching all the things you can do with your phone and whatnot. And about two o'clock in the morning, ding, 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 someone is at your front door. This, you know, first of all, it's kind of scary, all right? Who's at the front door in the middle of the night? Secondly, 
we turn our camera on and look face to face with a lizard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he was just there staring at us like, hey, what's this? Is that a camera? And, and so uh, we have to learn to kind of, um, you know, be a little bit more selective about what we watch. But yeah, we've seen lizards and frog and, and all kinds of interesting things out there. We may even have an evening routine of checking our doors before we go to bed to make sure they're locked. That takes me to another story back from Elizabeth City to uh, North Carolina. We were all asleep. Two kids were up in their beds, and we were uh, in asleep. And all of a sudden, we just started hearing a pounding on our back door. What in the world is going on? And some shouting and kind of incoherent stuff. And it was incoherent because the guy beating on our back door was obviously drunk or high or both, maybe. And he said, I'm going to use your phone. I said, no, you're not going to use our phone. You need to move on. I don't even know. And I said, move on. We're going to call the cops and all this kind of stuff. And eventually, he just kind of shuffled away and who knows where he went. I looked at the door that night. And in our door, if the lock was, if the little twisty thing was horizontal, it was unlocked. But if it was vertical, it was locked. That night, we had not locked their door. All that guy would have had to do is twist a doorknob and he'd have been in our house while we were upstairs. I mean, you know, it just kind of sent the chills down my spine. Like, what, what did we just escape here by the grace of God? So I made two decisions that night. Number one, I bought a gun. Well, if I'm being honest, I bought several guns through the years. Uh, yeah. But number two, I don't go to bed without checking our, our, our locks. Mary would say, what are you doing? I'm just checking the doors. Just checking the doors. I want to be prepared. We need to be prepared. Those foolish virgins wanted the others to give them their oil. And like I said, maybe at first glance, oh, that's awful mean of them. They said no. That's awful selfish. They wouldn't share what they had. But they did not have enough for them to get into the banquet if they shared with these others who wouldn't have enough either. They were not being selfish. That's not the case at all. They were personally obligated to be prepared. They had a job to do. They would have been just as unprepared as the others if their lamps went out. So all they could do at that late moment was rush into the city, see if you can find someone who will sell you a little bit. So they scurried off to find some, but we know for them it was about to be too late. What do I get from that? I get this. You cannot go to heaven just because your mama was a Christian. You do not have enough good works in your life that you can share some with an errant spouse or errant children to get them into heaven. You have to be prepared, your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your co-workers, all those that you love, you, you can help them, you can point them in the right direction, but whether or not they're prepared is solely up to them. And to put it right at basic level is, I'm accountable for me and you are accountable for yourself. The scriptures say that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Romans 14, 10, 2 Corinthians 5. 10. We will all give an account for my life. And I can't say, well, my mom was a real great lady. She was a hard working, sacrificial. And that, that, and that would all be true. But I still have to give an account for my life. And you have to give an account for yours. So we have to be prepared for his coming. And it's an individual choice we all must make. Leads us to the third point here this morning. And that is this. There are consequences for being unprepared. And those consequences are eternally devastating. Yeah. Eternally devastating. Now we find here the five foolish virgins. They did go into town. You can just see them. Man, we got to go. Where can we go? Who's open? Or who can we disturb at this hour of the night? They tried to find something at the last minute. And apparently they did because they are now rushing back to this place where the celebration was to be held. But by that time the bridegroom has come. The door was shut. The door was locked. And no one else was getting in. And to hear those words, I don't know who you are. Too late for them. We remember from the Old Testament. For about 120 years, I think, we're told that Noah spent uh, his time building an ark. 
And probably for the majority of those years, people would come by and scoff and laugh and make fun of him and say, no, you realize there's not much water around here. What are you doing building a boat? And they probably thought that was pretty amusing. But when the rains came and the floods started to rise, I wonder if some of those same people were beaten on the boat, saying, let us in. Only for them, it was too late. And they went to their death and to their doom because their realization came after it was too late. Scripture records, I think, some statements. Now, there are so many uplifting and beautiful and encouraging and verses in the Bible that just fill our heart with such love and such hope and expectation. But there are some other verses that the Scripture records for us about what's going to happen to people one day that ought to really grab our attention. I think about what Jesus said about the man who would betray him. That man, of course, was Judas. And Jesus said about him, it would have been good if that man had never been born. Think about that for a minute. There's no doubt about where Judas Iscariot is today. The Apostle Paul spoke of a man who once was his co-worker in the gospel on evangelism tours and there and he's mentioned two or three times in the scripture a fellow by the name of demas and at first he's saying you know demons uh, demas is a good co-worker of paul he's doing great things for the lord but by the time you get to second timothy chapter four here's what paul says for demas having loved this present world has deserted me. He loved the world more than he loved Christ. He loved the comfort and the pleasure more than he was willing to endure the sacrifice or the persecution that came along with it. And again from Jesus as he describes those events of the last day when men will come to judgment, he says these words to the goats, those who are on the left side. I don't think it gets sadder than this. Depart from me. Imagine Jesus saying that to you, to those you love. Depart from me, I never knew you. Just like a couple weeks ago when we were talking about another hard subject of dying, we don't want to hear about weeping and wailing and suffering and gnashing of the teeth, but Scripture surely brings that concept out about a, a punishment of an eternity in hell. We have to believe that hell is real. And it's terrifying. And those who aren't prepared are going there. There's an author I like by the name of Mark Moore. And Mark Moore put it this way about the five foolish virgins. He said, their lack of preparation betrays their lack of love. Let me put that another way. When we are prepared for the second coming, we are demonstrating our love for Christ. If we aren't preparing for a second coming, then we really don't care all that much. Because if we did, we'd evaluate the way we live. We'd evaluate our relationships. We'd evaluate our habits and where our priorities really lie. If we truly loved the Lord. I hope today we can say we all look forward to that day of the second coming. Now, I have no doubt that when that trumpet blast comes, we're going to be surprised, we're going to be shocked. But then deep down in our hearts, we've been saying, I've been looking forward to this day. Oh, how I've longed to see the return of Jesus. Maybe we'll be able to say, like the Apostle Paul said, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's be wise. Let's be prepared. And yes, let's help others get prepared as well as they must do before it's too late. Truly, we don't know the day or the hour. And again, don't trust anybody who says they do because they're wrong 100% of the time. An author who's long gone to glory put it this way, men cannot find out the time and get ready at the last minute, but must be ready all the time. Are you ready for that day? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise of the return of the Lord. And we do look forward to that day, even though it gives us a little sense of dread and fear. But we know that those who are faithful to you will indeed hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to evaluate where we are in our walk with you, that if we need to make some changes, if we need to get prepared in a better way, that we'll decide today that's what we're going to do. Thank you for the scripture and the lessons it teaches to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.